Holy Gospel according to, to the evangelist Mark, the seventh chapter, beginning at the first verse. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their, teachers are, <clears throat> their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. As we turn to the Lord's word, let's uh, ask him to assist us as we pray. Father, our request is simple. Uh, through Jesus, you told us that you'd send your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word for us individually and as a people. Please do so tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a name once used to describe the church and <clears throat> the church on earth. It's an old-fashioned name for the church that sojourned through this mortal life. It used to be called the church militant. The word gathered its power from Jesus' words to the apostle Peter in Matthew 16 when he declared that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the, against the armies of the kingdom of God. The church militant is us, if we're faithful people, faithful people who obey God, who do battle with evil in this fallen world until that day, promised throughout Scripture, when following our captain, the church becomes triumphant as a whole. We're look, going to look at two texts today, two of the ones we heard. We'll examine them and see how they, the Tanakh and the New Testament light is shed on the character of the church militant and the strategies by which we become the church triumphant. If I were to put this message into a, a single sentence, it would go something like this. God's people 
spiritually prepared and armed, will resist and overcome evil. God's people, spiritually prepared and armed, will resist and finally overcome evil. In different but complementary ways, Moses and the Apostle Paul wrote some encouraging but, but also fairly bracing warnings to the people of God in their care. So if you would uh, pick up your Bibles, go to your Bible app, and scroll down to Deuteronomy 4, we'll begin there. Uh, yes, if you've got an old-fashioned Bible, you can turn there too. That would be all right. Let's start with a bit of background. Moses wrote Deuteronomy as a speech. I think you're familiar with that from Deuteronomy 30 and 31, his last words, as it were, to the children of Israel. So I suppose, as he wrote this, I can envision him writing this before he, uh, before he delivered it. These last words may reflect his very real concern for the future of God's people, his brothers and sisters, the Israelites. His conclusion is actually pretty memorable, and its theme is consistent throughout his speech, throughout the whole of Deuteronomy. If the Israelites live out the Lord's guidelines or laws, the master of the universe, God the Father, will live among them. Unfortunately for those of us who speak English, the word guidelines is more often translated as laws, and at least to contemporary English speakers, law has kind of a, a negative effect on the human psyche, uh, as though it's restrictive or sour or a bit punitive. Fortunately, I expect most of you know better and you understand that what the Lord intended in the Torah was the guidelines for the good life as God intended us to live it. I suppose that means, of course, if, if you don't like the guidelines, you're opting for a bad life. But whatever it might, it might be, Moses was not trying to be punitive, I don't think. He was, well he was concerned for the well-being of his people in the hopes that they would become the people God wanted them to be and realize the, the fullness of his blessing. So we'll look at verses 1 to 5 first. The NIV translation which we use does sound that punitive note. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you, Moses wrote and said. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land. Now, we need not to miss this today. Moses is telling the Israelites how they need to live because they're going to war. The people they will fight were notorious around them among their neighbors for child sacrifice, for wanton sexuality, and for cruelty. The usual behaviors that accompany paganism whose roots, of course, are in the demonic. Victory, he reminded them, dependent on their spiritual faithfulness. Only then would the Lord be among them in power to achieve their victory. Six to eight, he explains a bit further. Verse six, observe them, the guidelines, carefully, because they, this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, that is, the Gentile pagans, as always, God intended his people to be a light to the nations around him. They will say, verse 7, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near to them the way the Lord our God is near to us whenever we pray to him? And he adds, verse 8, and they'll also honor and wonder at such righteous decrees. And then Moses adds a warning, verse 9, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget. I think we can extract four things from this short text. First, when the creator of the universe is among his people, the power of it among them is by definition overwhelming. The power of God among his people is overwhelming power. His presence as most of us know, depended not just on human moral perfection, which would make it hopeless, 
but rather on the way in which God set up um, repentance and forgiveness as a means of staying close to him through holiness. Thirdly, their righteousness and the Lord's presence would be very clear to the pagan Gentiles around them, and that clarity was essential to their purpose as a people. There's only, I think, one thing missing, or kind of missing. Moses makes no mention of partnership, direct partnership, between the Lord in battle, he's the victor, and working with those with whom the victory will be, met, will, be, will be caused. That is, working with his people as opposed to for his people. I know it's a fine point, but I think it's necessary for us to understand the extra blessings we receive because we're under the new covenant. What about for us? I think there's a point that comes all the way down through those 1,200 years, I mean 3,200 years to us. The degree which God's people live as the Lord intended life to be lived, the greater will be his, his presence among them. It's not a new theological idea here, but the greater holiness with which we live, the greater the presence of God among us we can expect in our lives daily and in our gathering together as a people. Freedom in Christ requires spiritual maturity and ultimately steadily becoming more and more like Jesus. In a similar way, Paul's letter to the house churches in Ephesus updates this principle of righteous living that brings the greater presence of the Lord. So if you would scroll down or turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Paul declares that's purpose sentence number one for this passage. Paul added a nuance, though. Be strong in the Lord. He got that from Jesus. It's a new covenant clarification. Strength that comes from the indwelling spirit of the Lord empowers us to partner with him. And then verse 11, he says his second purpose sentence for these two paragraphs that follow. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now we'll cover that in just a couple of minutes. So verse 12, Paul speaks to his first point, makes clear why we need the Lord's strength. And it's an uncomfortable teaching. Disciples... He writes, do not, <clears throat> do not, do not fight against flesh and blood, not against political opponents, not progressives against conservatives or conservatives against progressives. No matter how much we as disciples disagree in good faith with a person, they still are not the real enemy, perhaps misguided but not the real enemy, not the person at work, the irritating family member, not the fellow believer who gossips about us behind our backs at church. The enemies, wrote Paul, are the rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world in the heavenly places. There's this whole story on how Paul saw that darkness and other people in scripture. We haven't time for it tonight. And some of you might be saying, well, hang on now. Aren't the rulers in the news feeds we read, you know, the uh, incompetent leaders in the West, the tyrants and terrorists in the East, aren't they the enemy? Or the ones in Israel's case who want to kill us? No, wrote Paul. They're not. Like in Job, as in Daniel, and in John's apocalypse, the enemy of our souls has been defeated, but his final vanquishing awaits that last day. It lies ahead, and he, like a cornered animal, is vicious. 
Some will say, what a primitive and mystical view. Oh, it's mystical, but it's not primitive. How else does one account for the evils, like the personal and perennial hatred of Jewish people that comes to us down through the century, being one of the smallest people groups on earth? Not logical, spiritual. I was brought up kind of short this summer while I was in America on a break. And maybe this will help you, because it was the application of this text that I needed to hear. A mutual friend introduced me to a friend of his that had been mutual, mutual officers, wing commanders in the American Air Force. And his friend was now an Orthodox pastor, a faithful and serious disciple. And his church had called him, and he responded reluctantly, to the office of exorcist. He wanted to speak to me, and so we had lunch together, because of Muslims and Jews who were being sent to him by counselors with afflictions that their knowledge was unable to handle. Generational curses that produced relentless oppression and sometimes indwelling demons. Mystical stuff. Now, he thought, because I work in Israel, I might be of some help to him. Little did he know that actually, apart from the prayers I now offer him for daily, he was actually a great help to me. He revealed the spiritual reality that I've always known about. I witnessed a couple of exor exorcisms. But still, day to day, I didn't take seriously enough. He shared the story of a man, I've made this slightly fictional for everyone's protection, one of three cousins, the only surviving members of a Jewish family. This was in Washington, D.C. This man was relentlessly oppressed, and despite great professional competence in government and career success, he returned to his home each evening only to be haunted by long nights of whispered lies flowing into his mind and emotional terror by an oppressing demon who, while not being able to oppress him because he'd be, indwell him because he'd become a Christian, the terrors were real. And the psychologists and psychiatrists could not find a remedy. When he'd become a Christian and found some relief, my new friend regularly met and prayed with him and sometimes prayed for him when he was in his deepest troubles. During one especially bad attack, my friend confronted the demonic oppressor. In Jesus' name, he said, who are you? The answer came out of the air. I was sent because of a curse. What kind of curse? His great-grandfather asked my master to assist him, to help him come to America and become wealthy. If I do, said my master, what do I get? My great-grandchildren, came the reply. This man's cousins, they were the great-grandchildren, by the way, had both already committed suicide. And my friend sent that demon away in Jesus' name. But that's why the balance of this passage is so critical to our well-being. To any of us who grew up in the church, what follows is probably kind of familiar. I don't know how it was in other cultures, the different ones you may come from. But where I came from, it was a staple of Sunday school teaching. Uh, for those of you who are younger and are American, or maybe even in Europe, you saw it in a comic book form, the full armor of God. I saw it as what was called a flannel graph. If you want to know what it is, you can ask me later. I don't think they have them anymore. The teaching was really sincere, but I think somehow we got a comic book view of a desperately real spiritual truth. 
Paul's next paragraph, taken, taken seriously, provides us with the means to resist, provides us with spiritual victory. It gives Paul's updated version of Moses' lecture to the ancient people of God about how we actually do in this world oppressed by evil and demonic power sometimes, not everywhere, how we find victory through the whole armor of God. He wrote, therefore, put on the whole armor of God so when that enormous evil comes to you, you can stand firm and resist. So quickly, an adult analysis of the armor. The belt of truth is, of course, the truth we know and learn from Scripture. But it's more, I think. Probably most of us here, if not all, know the spiritual weakness that come with the accusing attacks of the enemy when we've told a lie and haven't confessed it. So the belt means also being truthful with God's help. And part of that truth is remembering that the real enemy is not our neighbor, is not human. They may behave wickedly because they're in thrall or they have no help, but they're deceived, how evil they may be, demonically deceived, and if you will, a kind of spiritual victim. And the breastplate of righteousness, the enemy of our souls, as Jesus told his disciples, is the father of lies. All of us know the spiritual affliction when we harbor a sin unconfessed. The enemy comes to us in whispered condemnations. There's no hope for you. And it haunts our minds and emotions when actually God never torments. He may convict and he will always forgive. We've left a chink in our armor, letting the enemy attack our hearts. And there's that curious offensive weapon, the sandals of peace, really an attitude that turns this military picture on its head, a hero who rushes towards the conflict, shouting out to the combatants against whom they really struggle, reminding them they can find their peace in him and they can drive away the evil one. And then Paul's words give the command to advance. Thrust out the, the shield of the Lord, the shield of faith, he says. Trust is the meaning here. Like Israel, that the Lord is with us in the midst of battle. That trust, he asserts, will cause the flaming arrows of our enemy to fall harmless at our feet. Faith here is trust and confidence that God is within us and is giving us the power with his help to actually, day by day, conquer evil, the evil within and the evil without. The helmet of salvation, this one's harder. When we trusted in Jesus, we put our lives at his disposal. He guaranteed our eternal safety from then through forever. But being mortal at the moment, our enemy tempts you and me to forget our eternal future. There's a simple remedy. Send him away in the name of Jesus because Jesus is the helmet of salvation. He has no right to intimidate us. And then the attack weapon. The sword of the spirit, the Bible. Again and again I've seen it work. If you know the word and are facing a fear-inspiring skeptic or accuser, ask the Lord for the words. As he promised at that last dinner before his crucifixion with his disciples, he said, the Lord will give you what you need to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the word of God. Say it. See what happens. There's one more. Verse 18. And it is the tactical nuclear weapon of spiritual warfare. Prayer in the Spirit. Concerted, focused intercession, guided by the Holy Spirit. If there were time, I could share about the 
faithful leader of a, of a whole phalanx of prayer warriors that have protected Sandy and me all these last 18, 19 years of ministry. It is this kind of prayer that conquers the enemy most of all, for those we pray for and for those who pray for us. Paul concludes the letter with a personal plea for those kind of prayers for himself. You may remember, this was about 62 AD. He was imprisoned in Rome, perhaps not long before his martyrdom, maybe aware that his time was short. That's why perhaps he emphasizes the warning about warfare at the end of his letter. And he asked for himself what all of us need, fearlessness in the face of the enemy of our souls. So, 2,000 years later, have those implements of war become obsolete? I think not. It's possible we've become a little rusty at using them. It's possible we aren't so sure about the warfare thing. Well, I'd, I'd suggest to you that tonight or tomorrow morning, you take out a piece of lined paper and a pencil or a pen and in a kind of personal way, make your own list of these weapons. And then give yourself a rating, one to five. How good am I at using them? And if you need help working through them, just get in touch with uh, the uh, secretary here, Sarah, at Christ Church, and one of us will meet and talk it through with you. But uh, having those weapons sharp and ready is really what's required. And those of you living, who are watching online, if you'd like to be prayed with or talk this through, you can write to office at cmj-israel.org, office at cmj-israel.org. Just a last word. In the depths of World War II in June of 1941, a professor of literature, C.S. Lewis, who many of you know, ascended the pulpit of St. Mary's Church in Oxford to preach the Sunday evening sermon, a famous sermon, concerned with spiritual conflict, with virtue, with spiritual rewards, and with the ultimate rewards of spiritual battle faithfully fought. As he drew near the end of the, of the sermon, Lewis said, it is, with, it is immortals with whom we joke, work, marry, snub and exploit. Immortals who will someday be horrors that you'd only see in a nightmare or everlasting splendors before whom you'd be tempted to fall down in worship. Of all the dangers of spiritual warfare, this is the most lethal weapon of the enemy. He will always divert our attention from himself to a human decoy, another person than himself. And in his cowardice, he hides behind them in order to accomplish his deceitful ambush. Near the end of his sermon, Lewis said, meanwhile, the cross comes before the crown, and tomorrow is a Monday morning. A cleft has opened this evening in the pitiless walls of the world, and we are invited to follow our great captain inside. The following hymn is, of course, the essential point. And indeed, tomorrow is a Monday, the battle will be neither romantic nor the stuff of films. Rather, it will be the hard slog of a soldier in the trenches, sometimes boring, sometimes terrifying, but always a matter of life and death. Nevertheless, if we follow our captain, the only possible outcome is victory. Father in heaven, we claim this victory through your Son and your Spirit. Give us your courage and your hope, your comfort and your perseverance in these most of, dif of most difficult times, we pray. In Yeshua's name, amen.